Uh, good morning, everyone. Can I welcome you to the second meeting of 2019 of the Social Security Committee? Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones or other devices and put them to silent mode so they don't disrupt the meeting? We've had one apology this morning. Unfortunately, our Deputy Commissioner Paul McNeill, MSP, can't be with us. And we move to agenda item one, decision to take items in private. The committee is asked to agree to take item five, consideration of evidence heard at item three on the EU Withdrawal Act to be taken in private. Is the committee agreed? Okay. Thank you to that. We move to agenda item two, Budget Committee 2019-2020. Uh, the committee will take evidence of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2019-2010-20. And can I welcome Shirley and Summerfield, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security, uh, with us this morning, and also your officials, uh, Anne McVie, Deputy Director, Social Security Policy Division, and James Wallace, Social Security Head of Finance, Scottish Government. Uh, so good morning, everyone. And can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement, and then we'll move to some questions. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking the committee for embracing the new budget scrutiny process this year. And the letter ahead of the budget statement focusing on the Scottish Welfare Fund was very helpful laying out the committee's views. Our spending plans are ambitious and clearly set out this government's commitment to creating a social security system based on dignity and respect. This is, of course, the first year that the social security budget is set out separately from the Scotland Act implementation budget line and does certainly provide more transparency both to Parliament and to the public. Following last month's publication of the draft budget, members will be aware of the Social Security and Older People portfolios focus on our overarching aims to create a fairer Scotland and tackle poverty and inequality. This budget recognises the cross-cutting nature of equalities and human rights and supports delivery of equalities objectives right across government. We support and celebrate the skills and talents of our older people and seek to reduce barriers for all to contribute to their communities. This budget continues to prioritise funding to support the design and implementation of our devolved social security powers. In 2019-20, our investment in social security will be over 560 million, supporting the programme of delivery and the administration of Social Security Scotland, with a forecast of 435 million of assistance going into the pockets of people living across the country. Key points for the portfolio in the budget this year include delivering new services while continuing to deliver the currently devolved elements of Social Security, maintaining funding for the Scottish Welfare Fund and discretionary housing payments, um, and investing 77.8 million in the Social Security programme to ensure the safe and secure transition of the remaining benefits to be devolved under the Scotland Act 2016. Social Security Scotland was established in September 2018 as an executive agency of the Scottish Government and now employs more than 270 people based in its headquarters in Dundee and in a second site in Glasgow. Once fully operational, Social Security Scotland will employ an estimated 1,900 people. All of these jobs are new to the Scottish Administration. Social Security Scotland staff are working with organisations and people with experience of the current system to ensure that recruitment is based on the principles of dignity, fairness and respect, and that Social Security Scotland represents both in spirit and in fact an investment in the people of Scotland by the people of Scotland. Our priority is taking on full responsibility for all the devolved benefits through a safe and secure transition so that people can continue to receive the right support at the right time and at the right amount. Our relationship with the Department for Work and Pensions plays an important part in our work throughout the devolution process to ensure this happens. 2019-20 will mark the third year of our social security programme and work continues at pace. I talk often about the complexities of the implementation programme and how we are using agile methodology to manage these complexities. I'd therefore like to take this opportunity to invite committee members to visit the programme staff in Victoria Quay and see Agile in action. It's the methodology that allowed us to successfully deliver the Carers Allowance Supplement and Best Start Grant in the current financial year. As I set out in my letter to the Social Security Committee on Thursday the 20th of December 2018, I'm pleased to report that the Carers Allowance Supplement payments are running smoothly. This government has put an extra £442 into over 
75,000 carers' pockets this year, an increase of 13% and an investment of over 33 million and made our commitment of paying carers this additional supplement in this financial year. Carers will also see their benefits retain their value with inflation level increases to carers' allowance and the carers' allowance supplement in 2019-20 of 2.4%. And in 2019-20, we expect to spend £37 million on carers' allowance supplement payments. Best Start grant represents a significant additional investment by the Scottish Government in comparison to the UK Government's Sure Start Maternity Grant provision, which it replaces. This new benefit provides a payment of £600 on the birth of a first child, which is £100 more than the Sure Start Maternity Grant. Second and subsequent children who get nothing under the DWP system will receive a payment of 300. Two further uh, payments, early learning and two further early learning and school age payments of 250 pound will be introduced by the summer 2019. The Best Start Grant uh, pregnancy and baby payments were launched on the 10th of December and as you are aware application numbers in the early days of operation were exceptional. The unprecedented response demonstrates a clear need for this new, more generous benefit and that people know that the Scottish social security system will be markedly different from the current UK model. Steady progress is being made in processing applications and making payments. This is a fantastic response to the Best Start grant and the budget reflects the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecasts which assume a start date of the 1st of June 2019 for the Best Start early learning and school age payments. Allocations will be refined once actual start dates are confirmed. In the meantime, I would like to reassure you that this is a demand-led budget and all eligible applicants will get a payment. We are also on track to deliver our new funeral expense assistance by summer 2019, improving the support available to lower income families struggling with funeral costs at a very difficult time. Arranging a funeral following the death of a loved one is hard and it can be even harder if funeral costs are an issue. We will widen support by 40% compared to the current payment and will support this with £2 million of Scottish Government funding above the transfer from Westminster, totalling £6.2 million. We are also working with people with experience of the current payment system to improve the parts of the process that people find most difficult at present. And we will be laying the funeral expense assistance regulations early in 2019. As well as continuing to deliver the newly devolved elements of social security in 2019-20, we will continue to invest in actions to mitigate the UK government's welfare reforms and support those in low incomes. In this financial year, we expect to spend over 125 million in total to mitigate the worst of the UK government's welfare reforms and to protect those on low incomes. This is over 20 million pound more than in the previous year. It includes investment of nearly £100 million for discretionary housing payments and the Scottish Welfare Fund to continue mitigation of the bedroom tax. We're also continuing to fund discretionary housing payments with assistance to the value of £63.2 million. This is, of course, on top of work uh, completed in other portfolios which also assist those on low incomes, the ending homelessness together, £50 million, for example, the £50 million in the Child Poverty Fund, a uh, tackling Child Poverty Fund, to give but two examples. This contrasts with the UK government welfare reform measures which are expected to reduce annual benefit spending in Scotland by £3.7 billion in 2020-21. Clearly, it is out with the capability of this Parliament to mitigate these cuts in full. However, we are taking important action to support individuals and families where we can. We should not and cannot use our budget to paper over the cracks of the UK government's mistakes. The Social Security and Older People Portfolio Budget for 2019-20 reaffirms this government's commitment to creating a fairer Scotland and tackling poverty and inequality. And this budget outlines the strong contribution that Social Security can make in this regard. I'd like to thank you, Convener, for the opportunity to address the committee this morning, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. A lot in that, um, and I'm sure a lot of positive things we'll explore as the meeting goes on, but also, I mean, it concerns the committee's had over a period of time before my um, incumbency as, as convener of this committee, when it was previously clear Adamson in relation to whether the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, meets the demand that, that's out there uh, in society, with local authorities obviously uh, 
delivering that. So how does the Scottish Government uh, assure itself that the £33 million that's provided for in, in, in the Welfare Fund uh, is enough uh, to meet uh, all the aspirations and needs that are, that are driven by the Welfare Fund itself? Well, as the committee will be uh, aware from my response uh, to their letter on the Scottish Welfare Fund, uh, the fund did help over uh, 300,000 individual households um, which is a, a very important lifeline to people on low incomes in times of crisis. Uh, we have ensured that we have uh, continued the, the funding of the Scottish Welfare Fund, and that is despite, of course, uh, the cuts that we are seeing um, from the Scottish Government's budget from Westminster and also the welfare cuts coming from uh, the UK Government in general. I would like to assure the committee that we take very seriously um, looking not just, of course, on, a, on an annual basis, um, but as the year goes on, uh, to constantly um, assess the Scottish Welfare Fund through the management information that we have from local authorities. That can be, for example, on applications and awards and expenditure. That uh, allows uh, officials and uh, through them, uh, through their briefings myself, uh, to keep a close eye on uh, the applications, for example, that are coming in from local um, authorities. So I appreciate the committee um, would wish to see more money in that budget, as is um, obviously their right to, to, to look at that and, and uh, raise those um, issues. Uh, but I hope they can take some comfort for the fact that we do take very seriously looking at the number, as see, of um, applications, of refusals, uh, the amount given um, in a grant, so that we are keeping up to date with what local authorities are spending year on year. That, that is helpful, Cabinet Secretary. I, I would note that the previous Commissioner in May uh, suggested there could be more money required for the Welfare Fund, and I'd written in November on behalf of the committee saying something similar in relation to growing pressures uh, out, out there in society. But I do know that it remains underspent uh, each financial year by the tune of two to three million pounds. So there does appear to be a disconnect between the numbers and what what we intuitively think is happening out there uh, in, in the communities that, that we represent. I noticed from our briefing uh, that in relation to the Community Care Grant, in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund, that in quarter one for the financial year 2016-17, that 66% of those grants were successful, but in quarter one, uh, for 2018-19, that was 58%. Uh, and for the same time periods for the crisis grant, that was previously 72%. Uh, and for quarter one, 18-19, that had fallen to 65%. So not huge decreases, but certainly a, a reduction. The concern the committee would like reassurance, reassurance over, I suppose, is that local authorities are not simply managing a tight budget uh, and therefore and the way of doing that is to you know approving less application of the welfare fund than maybe, maybe perhaps they would like to well um, certainly that's one of the, the aspects that we we do look very closely at so that the number of applications for example for uh, community care grants um, has um, increased the acceptance rate for that has dropped slightly um, year on year. Um, we do note also, of course, the number of reviews that, that take place in that, and that is, a, is a, in some ways a, a test to see if the correct decisions were being made by um, the local um, authorities. Um, and um, over half of the original decisions are up upheld uh, for community care grants. The number of crisis grant applications um, has um, increased um, over um, the last years um, and the acceptance rate has fallen slightly um, last year. Um, but I think it's also um, important to look at the amount of money that is actually being given in the um, awards. So, for example, um, for crisis grants, the award, the average award in 13-14 was £71. Um, for 17-18, it was 77. So, we're not seeing a decrease in the amount that's being awarded 
um, to people as, as we go on. Um, when we're looking at the community care grant um, average awards, it's went from 638 in 13 14 to 600 in 2017-18, so a very slight increase. You may, you know, one of the, the things, you know, that would be obvious to, to look out for is if we were seeing the amount that people were being given um, would be a, a sign of, of concern, but we're not seeing that um, coming through. You're quite right to point out, um, convener, that uh, local authorities will use their money um, in different ways. Um, we have... Um, some local authorities who our um, management statistics, so these are not official statistics, but what we look at uh, month on month, um, we're seeing around uh, 19 local authorities are roundabout on budget or below where we would um, expect, with a further um, within 3% of where we'd expect at this time of year. There are some uh, local authorities um, who spend right up to their limit. There are some who have an underspend that carries on into the next year. And all of those different um, percentages and the ways that money is spent through the year is, is very closely um, analysed to, again, spot to see if there are any areas of concern. And of course, if, if there are, then officials will have very close liaison with the local authorities during the year to, to, to kind of check in to see why decisions are being made. And they're reassured that there are no issues in that area. I, I would certainly, I think the committee would welcome more information in relation to that specific process. I note in the reply to, to the letter that I'd previously written to, to your Cabinet Secretary on behalf of the committee, one of the things you said, the Scottish Government is reviewing the statutory guidance on the Scottish Welfare Fund in the early part of well, next year now, now this year, of course. Oh. So there's also a mechanism in there as well in terms to make sure that um, if there is sufficient funding in the welfare fund, um, that, that all is good with that. But if there looks an anticipated shortfall, should demand increase? Because I think we're all, we're all seeing what we feel is demand increasing in our communities, but not necessarily that demand increasing with the welfare fund. And we'd have some concern around that. So what mechanism do you have in place in relation to if that increased demand does manifest itself in relation to applications to the welfare fund that local authorities are managing it properly and what flexibility is there in the Scottish budget to provide additional or reallocated monies given the tight budget situation to make sure the Scottish welfare fund has got enough cash? Well, the Scottish Welfare Fund um, budget is, is set during this process and the allocation of that to the local authorities is set by a, a, a formula that has been agreed by COSLA um, and that is based um, on um, SIMD figures. So the, the allocation between local authorities isn't set by Scottish Government alone, but is agreed with the local authorities. It, last year was the first year um, where that new formula was in, in place um, in its totality. Um, it's, the Scottish Government and uh, COSLA have a uh, ongoing discussions on the Scottish Welfare Fund and, and they'll uh, continue to be so. Um, when we're looking at the, the management, I suppose, of the Scottish Welfare Fund, what we obviously have as well is, is close working relationships with uh, officials at government level and the different local authorities. And there are uh, good practice uh, discussions throughout the year to ensure that local authorities, while using their local discretion, are following the statutory guidance within that. So the guidance is there to, to, uh, to not uh, dictate how uh, the local authorities uh, use their money in this aspect. It is guidance that they should be mindful of and officials are there during the year uh, to encourage uh, good practice from local authorities as we move through that. Okay, I have no further questions, Cabinet Secretary, but just for clarity, when I used the expression reallocation, I didn't mean from one local authority to another, I meant from one part of the portfolio to another. I'm just very conscious of the financial situation that, that exists in Scotland right now and any more information you can provide us in writing in relation to uh, the mechanism by which you make sure that the forecast budget, as agreed by COSLA, it's not an exact science, is fit for purpose as we progress through the, the, the forthcoming financial year. We'd be welcomed by this committee to, to allow us to grab 
grapple with whether or not 33 million is indeed an appropriate sum for the Scottish Welfare Fund. I think that would be helpful. A couple of supplementaries in this and some further questions. Alison Johnson, to be followed by Shona Robison. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Cabinet Secretary, for your evidence so far this morning. Just for a bit of clarity, um, clearly there are some areas, I appreciate not all, where there was an overspend in 2017-18. Eight overspent, including areas with large populations, such as Edinburgh and North Lanarkshire, and several, including Glasgow, were really close to their allocation. And when we took evidence last year, um, Morag Johnston from Glasgow City Council said, the statistics and the evidence for Glasgow show that the allocation that we receive through the distribution model isn't sufficient to, to meet demand. Now, I appreciate what you're saying about closely monitoring demand, um, where it's where, it, you know, where the, the funding is being exceeded and, and where it's not being required, but are you... <coughs> Are you clear as yet that underspend is reflecting a lower level of need? Or are you still looking at as to whether or not it's just about the way that particular local authority is managing the fund? Well, it is up to the, the local authority to determine uh, each uh, decision that comes forward for the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, it, therefore, the government obviously sits apart from the decision that was made on an individual basis for that welfare fund uh, decision. We encourage local authorities to um, ensure that there is a promotion of the Scottish Welfare Fund, that those that are eligible for the Scottish Welfare Fund um, are being made aware of it and being um, assisted to apply for that if they require um, that <coughs> assistance. Um, I can appreciate that committee um, would wish this budget to, to be higher. Um, this is um, a budget which has been discussed by this committee um, previously. Um, the money that has um, went into the Scottish Welfare Fund over a, a number of years um, will have different pressures <laughs> at different times, depending on what is, is happening. But I think the relationship that we have with local authorities, um, as I say, because of the work that we're doing around applications, around um, ensuring that the number of awards granted percentage-wise um, is not showing you know, dramatic uh, decreases, statistically significant decreases, um, <coughs> satisfies me that the welfare fund is being um, well used, well utilised by local authorities in relation to, to what's um, required of them um, and that that process works well year on year. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now there's two more supplementaries uh, of, in relation to the welfare fund. Now, my apologies to the members to ask them to make those brief. I know I spoke for some time on it, but there are a number of themes we have to cover in this morning's scrutiny session, but I'll take, take those now. Shona Robinson, followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Um, so, I think, for, first of all, just for clarification, my understanding is that the, the £2 million underspend is being carried forward for 2019-20, which will mean a budget of £35 million, pounds, so, which is positive, but presumably that would need to be carefully used because it wouldn't necessarily be recurring, or would it be recurring? Underspends aren't taken away. On, uh -huh. on, from the, the welfare fund, so it's not like um, you know, what you don't want to get into is a position at the end of the financial year where uh, decisions are, are not being taken appropriately. So underspends are not taken away from the local authorities. Obviously, it depends year on year how much underspend they have, that, so that, that would um, vary from year to year. Okay, so moving on to the formula then. I mean, I understand uh, how you know, formulas are, are negotiated and, and are based... Uh, presumably on a, a number of, of existing um, uh, ways of, of allocating to local authorities, uh, and I understand that. However, <clears throat> I guess there is a lo lot of local variation emerging here. So you have some local authorities overspending or spending to their limits, some underspending, some supplementing the welfare fund with their own resources. So I guess my question is, is this, that... Is there the opportunity in the light of going from the formula um, as was set to seeing in practice over a period of time what that actually results in, in terms of a, a, a more accurate factual 
the picture of local need, <coughs> is there the opportunity in the light of that evidence to then review the formula? Because it strikes me that it, that it can't be right going forward if there are local authorities consistently underspending and others that are not being able to meet need. That would suggest to me that, um, and hopefully would suggest to COSLA, that there would be a need potentially to look at the formula again in the light of the actual practice of, of spend in, in real time. I mean, certainly, I mean, the, as, I, as I think I said in a, a previous answer, this is the, the first year that we're in just now, the first financial year where uh, the formula has been <coughs> completely based on SIMD um, statistics as agreed by uh, COSLA. It is very important, of course, once we get the information in for the year um, in total, to have a look at that and to see um, whether that formula is working and um, from <coughs> our point of view and, and from COSLA's point of view. As I say, it's not our formula, um, the government alone, to, to review. But I'm certainly um, open and, and we are planning to, to analyse what comes in under the formula and um, ensure that people are, are content with that. And if there are discussions um, at our local authority level um, around that um, from COSLA, uh, that uh, would have any uh, concerns or points where they want this to move forward, then we're certainly open to that. OK, I think that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm, am I right in saying, you know, according to our papers, funding for the Scottish Welfare Fund was transferred from the UK government in 2013. So my question is around, one, according to the papers, we haven't, it hasn't kept pace with inflation, so it stayed, has it stayed exactly the same as it was when it was transferred? And secondly, as, as it was a transferred benefit in terms of the financial side, is there any restrictions on the use of it? Um, has it got to stay like that? Is it, is it a sort of added to the block grant forever now, or does it disappear if it disappears? You see what I mean? Uh, well, of, of course, the, the Scottish Government took the decision to move forward with the Scottish Welfare Fund, where in um, England there are no such funds um, given uh, by the DWP, but we did feel it was important to continue um, with this type of funding under a devolved settlement. Um, the um, aspects around the, the Scottish Welfare Fund um, is set out in legislation, um, and there are um, specific areas, I suppose, in which you could see the Scottish Welfare Fund um, is spent. So the crisis loans, for example, um, is, is one example of that. Uh, we have the opportunity within Scotland to determine how that money um, is um, spent um, to ensure that it's meeting what we believe the, the principles of the fund should be, which is to help people in times of, of mm -hmm. crisis. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would continue this fund's principal um, aim to be around. Right, so the money is not attached specifically to having to deliver that remit. It's now part of the block grant. That, that's what I'm trying to establish. Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Thank you. Sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. OK, that was quite a lot of time spent in the Welfare Fund. I thought that was important, given we're, we're ongoing dialogue uh, with the Scottish Government in relation to that, but a, a significant amount of other themes uh, now that we're hoping to cover. Uh, Keith Brown. Yes, uh, thanks for your evidence, uh, Cabinet Secretary. I just wondered, in your opening statement, you mentioned things like um, Best Start grants and uh, funeral expenses, which really, I think, go to the idea of a genuinely cradle-to-grave um, welfare system. But you, I think, are spending, the Scottish Government spending around £90 million on mitigation of um, uh, Westminster measures. Um, and I suppose really my question is to find out if you've given any thought, and you may not have done, but if you've given any thought as to what you would prefer to be spending that £90 million on, are there a series of things where you could go further in terms of a Scottish social security system? I would imagine you'd want it to stay in your portfolio. But um, are, are there other things that are being frustrated by the fact that you're having to mitigate so much of what Westminster is doing? Well, I'm sure Mr Mackay would have a view on what he'd like to spend that, that mitigation money on um, as well. But... Um, uh, um, Keith Brown is quite right to point out that the money, if we're spending it on uh, mitigation and uh, supporting low-income families because 
of what's happening down in Westminster, particularly because of uh, welfare cuts, is money that we are not spending elsewhere. Um, I'm uh, very aware as we go forward with the different aspects of social security that uh, stakeholders, uh, the committee, um, other members of parliament um, will have wishes for me to do more. And we've had that discussion, I know, over Best Start Grant, funeral expense assistance. Um, we will have it over the Young Carers Grant, Job Grant. All of the decisions about how much this, the Scottish Government is spending have to be done on the basis of I have to have one eye on um, the, the measures that we are undertaking to mitigate the worst excesses of that £3.7 billion cut to welfare expenditure that I've said. So uh, I think it, um, in, in, a, in an ideal world, which I can't see happening under uh, the um, continuing ideology down at Westminster, um, there are a myriad of different ways that we could be spending that, uh, that uh, money that we are currently spending on welfare mitigation to support those on low incomes and to use in social security. Although, as I say, I'm sure uh, my uh, colleagues in Cabinet would also have um, ideas about how they could also spend that money. But you're quite right to point out that that money is, is used for that. It's not being used for, it, for something else. Yeah, just if I could briefly come back on that, I, I think what's been done in terms of mitigation is absolutely right. And if you look at the Trussell Trust's statement on the rise in food bank, substantial rise in food bank use when universal credit moves into an area, you can see there's a genuine need there. But the take from the answer you've just given it really, if you were to have that money or such proportion of it as you were allowed to keep, um, it would be to build upon the different initiatives that you've taken already rather than any other new initiatives that might be waiting in the wings to be taken forward if more resources became available. Well, I think the, the opportunities that the Scottish Government has under um, its new powers um, would allow us to look very seriously at what else can be done. And indeed, we are doing that, of course, with the income supplement. Um, that is uh, yet another example of a, a very um, ambitious policy um, that will have a, a significant cost attached to it. Um, that we will have to fund through our Scottish Block Grant while continuing to fund mitigation measures uh, to support um, those on uh, very low incomes. So, you know, again, you could you could use that money in, in many different ways. I just launched uh, the job grant consultation, for example, yesterday, um, which um, seems to be very welcome for stakeholders and the um, um, support that will give young people to uh, to um, provide for travel costs, um, clothing costs, to be able to get them into a new job. What more could we do? Uh, what more could we do on the Young Carers Grant? I know the committee had uh, a great discussions um, about the amount that we were putting forward for the Young Carers Grant and whether that was sufficient for, for young carers. Um, there are a number of um, areas that we're already doing, but we're looking very seriously at what else we could do under our new powers um, but that has to be done within our budget, obviously. Okay. okay so very one last question. Does all those things taken together mean that you could be looking at, or have you done any work on all those things being superseded by, for example, an initiative to have a guaranteed basic income? The basic income is, is again, an, another um, ambitious policy which we have over the longer term. I, I share um, with uh, Cabinet Secretary Lynn Campbell responsibility um, for this and um, she's in particular looking at the pilot areas that we're looking at for that at, at the moment to see what could be learned and I think again I hope that points to the innovative ways that the Scottish Government is attempting to look at what we can do to tackle um, the, the um, areas around poverty and um, particularly child poverty in a more innovative way than simply just um, doing more of the same um, and, and putting out uh, benefits in the manner that the DWP do. Okay, uh, brief supplementary, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Kavina. Um, part of the mitigation um, measures budget is the financial health check, which there is going to be £3.8 million spent over the next two years. And it was just to ask if the government is setting um, a target for the number of people they hope to reach and the amount of money they hope to um, improve or the amount of money they hope to, to, to be able to support people to claim just in light of the statistics um, produced by Northern Ireland, which has shown over the last year um, their benefit uptake campaign 
It resulted in £37 million of additional income for, for citizens in Northern Ireland. I'll perhaps get back to the committee on that. That's a specific area um, that doesn't sit within my portfolio, but sits within Ailing Campbell. So within the weighted tomb that I have in front of me, I do not have uh, the details um, for specific targets um, for that, but I'll certainly get that uh, provided to the committee. But you do, in general, point, of course, uh, to a, a, a very uh, point to a very important point around ensuring that people have. Um, benefit take-up. That is, of course, something which the committee is discussing, which is within my portfolio that we're looking at very seriously within Social Security to ensure that we do everything that we can to ensure that those are eligible take up their benefits. But I'll provide uh, the committee with details of what's in Ms Campbell's portfolio um, in due course. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Alistair Allen. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Um, uh, good morning. I was um, hoping to ask a little bit about the payments, uh, a little bit about the payments that have been made to the DWP. Um, I note that, in particular, the um, Scottish Government's administrative costs for 1920, um, with regard to implementation costs, um, are under negotiation, as I understand it. So, I just wondered what the what uh, was being negotiated and, and where that was headed, please. Well, it is something which um, I'll perhaps bring um, my colleague James Wallace in, in in this in a in a in a second. But it is something which um, we we do take a uh, very serious consideration of when we are looking at our dealings with DWP. There are a myriad of, of uh, different um, ways in which we have to continue to um, interact with the DWP. So, um, for example, just around um, Best Start grant initiative, obviously we have to um, um, we have to give money to the DWP because we want to verify people's identity using a DWP system. So there's a cost from the Scottish Government to the DWP um, to allow us to run the Best Start grant in the easiest way for the applicant because we don't have to get them to recheck um, and re-verify their identity when they've already done it for DWP. For example, again, that we have um, within the Carers Allowance Supplement, um, we need them to data scan who is entitled to Carers Allowance Supplement, and therefore there's money, again, that's transferred to DWP from uh, the Scottish Government to allow that to happen. So these costs um, come from a variety of, of different budgets, and they will change year on year, depending, of course, on what the Scottish Government will be doing. But I don't know if you want to add, James, a bit something about the negotiations that are currently ongoing. Okay. Um, I can add. I can add a little bit, to that, Secretary. Thank you. Um, the, there's there's essentially two categories. There's the 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 costs we pay them where they're administering something on our behalf. Um, the costs there may vary year on year depending on the volumes that DWP administer for us. Um, we speak at an operational level, officials speak weekly to DWP to monitor those costs um, and to agree them um, under the, the, the agency agreement that's in place. Um, on, administra on, on implementation costs, um, it, it's case by case depending on what the programme is actually doing and what we actually need DWP to do. Um, and at, at an operational level, we'll take the fiscal framework agreement and we'll interpret that with DWP to decide what is and is not rechargeable. Um, and then we'll have all those costs validated, discussed, talked about whether they're, they're appropriate under the fiscal framework, and then recharges will take place. Um, so it, it is a, an ongoing and live negotiation that never ends. Um, I think that one of the, the aspects that is important, of course, is that point that James points to within the fiscal framework, that um, if we are asking DWP uh, to change something in their system to allow us to deliver something up here, we are charged for that. So the, the, that, 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 again, depends, as, as James says, on what happens year on year. But the fiscal framework um, aspects around this, around charging, uh, require us to do those negotiations exceptionally carefully to ensure uh, value for money for what we're doing up here. Uh, you mentioned that the, the work never ends. So, I'm, again, I'm, I'm just curious to know um, what kind of development work might uh, lie ahead, what might be requested for the coming year, what, to give an illustration of the kind of what, what, what the development work might actually mean in practice. Well, in, in, in essence, it's any changes um, because of what we're um, doing with the new devolved benefits that are on stream for the completion of Wave 1 and Wave 2. 
So um, anything that we require DWP to change, as I say, we will have to, to look at. Now, I can't give, I suppose, specific examples of that because we're still formulating the policies for what uh, Wave 2, for example, will, will look like. Um, but there have had to be um, changes um, made to allow us to run Wave 1. And those types of changes will, will have to be made um, again when we're looking at the Wave 2 benefits. Obviously, obviously in the, the past, it hasn't always been straightforward getting information from the DWP. So are you, you satisfied that these negotiations are being provided with adequate information at the moment from the DUP? The DUP, WP. <laughs> it was a Freudian slip in the current situation. <laughs> the DWP. I, um, I think my negotiations with the DWP are complicated <laughs> enough without bringing in another party. Um, I, I think these are always going to be very difficult uh, negotiations. Um, I can appreciate from the DWP's point of view uh, that they will want to ensure that they are pressing my officials as hard as they can, and they do. Uh, but likewise, I am uh, very uh, content that at Scottish Government level, we are doing everything um, we can to push back when, for example, um, we think the DWP would be making changes anyway, and it's not because we've asked them to do something because of devolved settlement that um, necessarily the charges should come down to us. Uh, so I can assure you it's something that's um, a, a lot of time and effort uh, goes into it and something that we take very seriously to ensure uh, that we are not being um, asked to pay money that we shouldn't be paid at that point, as you would expect us to. You know, I think the DUP's non-involvement is probably helpful in this. Uh, I, I suspect members might want to see a uh, Department of Work and Pensions moving forward if they're, if they're not too sure of that. Of, of, of how to express it. Uh, Michelle Ballantyne, over to yourself. Okay, thank you. A couple, couple of quick supplementaries, and then do you want me to go on to my well, substantive? Supplement you on this, then go to your substantive question. Yeah. Okay. Um, quick one, the, the um, health check money, is that part of the announcement that was made um, by the... Westminster DWP when they were talking about the 30 odd million that was going to cap? Uh, the financial health check money is a Scottish, if this, you're referring to what Mark Griffin was yes. referring to earlier, is a Scottish government um, initiative. Um, the um, money that it's uh, been given from DW, uh, you've got me at this now, the Department of Work and Pensions to, um, to, to citizens' advice um, for um, looking at the implementation of universal credits, it's very separate, and that is a UK government um, that, um, a scheme dealing directly with citizen advice, including citizens' advice Scotland. Right, so we are getting a share of that. That's the key thing as well. Um, it is yeah. going directly to citizens' advice Scotland, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I, d I just want to move to um, talk about the costs of running um, Social Security Scotland and, and what's being delivered there. Um, I asked the question, I see it's appeared in our papers as well, in terms of the breakdown of the 41.5 million that was forecast for 2019-20 um, running costs, of which obviously 6.1 million um, is the payment to the DWP for running the, the um, benefits that are currently being delivered by them. And am I correct in saying then that the, the benefits that we are currently delivering under Social Security Scotland during that year amount to, I think it's 58 million. Um, so looking at the, the costs of the staff and the buildings, etc., a, a quick calculation, it appears that it's costing 60% of what we actually deliver in running, or are, are, are the figures I've got in front of me not, not working? You're shaking your head. <laughs> so... I think perhaps if you want to run me through your question one more time, my apologies, and we'll... Right. So the cost, the cost you gave me in terms of what Social Security Scotland is costing us next year to deliver, next financial year, is 41.5 million. Okay, 6.1 million of that um, goes to the DWP to deliver the benefits that they're currently delivering. Okay. Um, which is we've got an overall forecast Scottish spend of 421 million, of which 283 million um, is being delivered by DWP. So that's the 61, 6.1 million mm. that we pay them. And the remaining um, amounts are delivered by us. So far, so good? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So 
when you take out that amount, what we're actually delivering, the cost of delivering it is about 60% of what we're actually delivering, equivalent to 60% of what we're delivering. I wouldn't agree with your assessment on that. I'll, I'll try and take you through some of this, but perhaps provide figures. In the money, I mean, it, it's equivalent to 60%. Right, so the, the 6.1 um, million um, to, the, to the DWP uh, isn't simply for carers' um, allowance, it's for also the carers' allowance supplement data scan and the Best Start grant um, verification identity payment and um, accounting. Um, the money that we are actually spending in terms of what we will deliver to people doesn't just include money that um, comes from a transfer from the DWP, but also additional money that we will be getting um, on top of that. So, for example, we are putting more money in um, for Best Start Grant. We're putting more money in for funeral expense assistance um, and so on as, as well. So the figure um, in terms of how much we are um, paying for um, for benefits, I would argue, is is higher than... 58.1? Sorry? 58.1 million? 58.1 million. I'll, I'll perhaps pass over to James, because my apologies, you've lost me a little bit in, in this aspect. I, 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 I see the calculation that you're making. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an unfair calculation, if I'm honest, at the moment. Um, I, I, it's a... It's a calculation that DWP traditionally carry out under a steady state when they're not doing different things. Social Security Scotland at the moment is involved in the delivery of benefits. It will be involved in 1920 in the delivery of Best Start Grant funeral expense assistance. Um, and those are some of the things that it does. Um, but some of the agency is also training, getting ready, preparing for wave two um, benefits that will come on stream. Um, that's costs that, that lead now. Um, that aren't necessarily attributable to the administration of benefits in the year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't so, have a problem with that. Sorry? Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. No, no. I, um, <laughs> I, th I think over time, as mm -hmm. the agency moves into a steady state, it will become a more valid calculation. Um, but I, th I think the agency is not involved solely in the administration of benefits at the moment, which I, I think devalues that calculation slightly. Well, can I ask you then, because first of all, my first question was just to establish that I was playing with the correct numbers, if you like, and that you weren't, you know, you weren't going to come back and say to me, no, that's completely wrong. So if we've established that those numbers are correct, when, in terms of, of the devolution of benefits and the, the taking on those responsibilities, because it's obviously this year there's been a number of staff that have come in post that have trained up to deliver the benefits that are going to be delivered in this year ahead. And in this year ahead, what you've just said is you're suggesting that there'll be training to deliver the next year ahead. So we don't have the numbers going forward, but what is your estimation then of the relationship between the cost of running Social Security Scotland and the delivery of benefits? Um, well, part of that will decide on the policy decisions um, that are taken around wave two, around what that um, looks like. So I couldn't give a, a kind of long-term analysis of, of that. Uh, but what I perhaps can speak about is give some examples of what's happening this year and in the forthcoming year um, that will um, hopefully assist with um, providing some e examples for that. Um, we're already um, having place staff for the setup and establishment of local delivery, something I know you uh, have asked about um, yes. in the past. Um, we're already seeing within this financial year what we'll have to do to staff up for Best Start grant payments, funeral expense assistance payments, but particularly the large aspect that will come on that that will have a, um, a, um, I suppose a greater impact on that overall cost is what we do around wave two and particularly disability benefits mm -hmm. um, as well. Um, our, we, we are always looking to ensure that Social Security Scotland is being run 
efficiently and effectively. Um, and that is a challenge um, that I will continue to put on the agency, as I know the agency it puts on itself. But we will take decisions to ensure that people have a service that treats them with dignity and respect. And that might mean that we will do things differently than what happens under the DWP. And if you were looking at a particular cost of doing something in a particular manner, um, it may appear um, that it's not as good value for money as DWP. But I would say that actually we will provide a service with dignity and respect for people. Um, and that will be done in a different way. So as our Social Security Scotland Agency develops and grows, um, you're kind of going to also be um, comparing apples and pears because we will just do things in a different way than the DWP will do. And I think quite rightly so because of the impact that the way, for example, disability assessments um, have on the people that are going through it. Only because of time constraints, I've got three other members wanting to come in and raise three other themes. I apologise for having to cut you off at this stage, but can I make a suggestion? If, if Speak it with them be... and ask the questions. It... Sorry? Go on, yeah. Well, well, that means three other members won't get in with their substantive questions, but it would be quite helpful if you could provide the committee with further information for what is a rolling programme of budget scrutiny, for what you believe the steady state administration's costs would be um, of the uh, of Social Security Scotland yep. once the set-up costs have, have 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 been established. I think it's an absolute valid and key line of scrutiny, but we do we do have to we do we do have to move on. Michelle Ballantyne or other colleagues won't won't get in. Uh, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Convener. Um, I wanted to ask um, about um, uprating um, and some specific questions, but first, more broadly on. Um, Uprating the government has chosen um, CPI as the measure to uprate um, with. There's long been calls from civic society, from charities and organisations that uh, represent people um, that RPI would be a, a more useful measure of inflation to uprate benefits with. Can you say why the government has chosen CPI over RPI? Well, it was it certainly something um, that I looked at in great detail as we are moving forward for annual up rating. Um, there were many aspects which um, the submissions covered. Um, some of it was around what the DWP did, for, for example, just to make sure we never fell behind what was going on um, in uh, the rest of the UK, unlikely though that would be. Um, for uh, another example is um, what are um, more commonly used um, variations for inflation now compared to 10 years ago, where um, RPI was more commonly used um, at, at that point. So um, there were a number of, of different um, um, areas um, that I perhaps won't have time to go into today that we looked at when, when I was um, analysing what we can do around um, uprating, but it's in, to, to, in essence to ensure that we chose the most meaningful um, the most meaningful measure of inflation that, that we could, uh, that was easily understood, um, that was something which relates to um, um, other uses um, for measuring inflation within what happens within the Scottish um, government. So I hope that gives a flavour of the types of aspects that, that we, we, we looked at and that there was, there was a, a great deal more, but it really was an analysis to ensure that it was a useful measure of inflation and one that was commonly used within government, in essence. Okay, thanks. I, I think because of the constraints of time, obviously not be able to go into that in as much detail as you would have maybe liked, but it would be helpful perhaps to, to supply that later. Um, in our papers today from, from SPICE, um, they have said that the uprating of the carer's allowance um, supplement is going to be 2.3%, um, but you in your opening remarks said that it would be 2.4%. Can you just clarify that it will be 2.4%? That's certainly the figure that's in all my briefings, yes. Okay, thank you. That, that's helpful. Um, Finally, just on um, specific entitlements, um, can you say whether the Best Start um, Pregnancy and 
baby payments will be uprated going forward? So it, there's no plans to uprate for 1920, and basically that was because it only came in and the, halfway through December um, for that. Um, obviously, as <coughs> the committee is, is well aware, there is um, uh, there are a number of uh, there are a number of benefits and payments which we are um, required and committed to annually uprating because of what's in the Social Security um, Act. Um, there's not a statutory requirement for us to um, uplift aspects around Best Start Grant. So that will be something that we will look on as part of the budget process. I suppose the important aspect that was also in the Social Security Act is that we have to be transparent and report to Parliament about our thinking on that and the reasons behind any decisions taken in that. So that will be part of the budgetary process, uh, but something which will, of course, be um, open to, to scrutiny, not just because of the usual budget process, but because of the requirements under the Act as well. Thank you, Camino. OK, I've got Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Alison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Camino, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I've just got two fairly brief questions, hopefully. Uh, the first one is, um, I think you helpfully said that it, this is a demand-led service and those that come forward and who are entitled to benefit will get it. Uh, we have heard on uh, a number of occasions in the last few weeks uh, from your colleague, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, and from the First Minister, that every penny has been worked out carefully. Um, I suppose what um, leeway within your budget is there? So, for example, if there was, for some unknown reason, within this financial year, something happened in regard to a particular benefit that required more to be paid, could that be met, or would you have to go back to the Secretary of Finance, Cabinet Secretary of Finance? Uh, well, this is a, um, an aspect which I can um, assure Jeremy Balfour um, weighs heavily on me and also the Cabinet Secretary for, for Finance that the, the level of uh, demand-led um, expenditure that we have and will, will, um, will continue to grow within Social Security um, Scotland is quite a key change for the Scottish Government. Um, it's not something... Uh, we've had small pockets, obviously, around, for example, um, educational maintenance uh, allowance and, and so on, but the, the level of demand-led budget is, is greatly increasing and will continue to do so. Um, the important aspect is, yes, if people are eligible for payments, they will be paid. How we deal with that within the Scottish uh, Government is to ensure that... Um, we keep an exceptionally close eye on that as we move forward. So within Social Security, um, we have a team from, um, from Finance Directorate who are effectively embedded, for want of a better word, um, within the Directorate. So this is happening continuously where we look at demand-led aspects um, and um, any red flags. Um, in essence, um, your first port of call is to deal with it as um, um, an in-year budgetary pressure within Social Security, um, and, and that is obviously the first port of call for any Cabinet Secretary, including myself. Um, and then, obviously, it's a, it's a wider pressure for, for government if it can't be contained within Social Security. So um, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance is quite right to point out that um, I, we are not sitting with um, an additional spare pot um, of money for any portfolio, um, including my own. And that's where um, the forecasting that we're doing, that the Scottish Fiscal Commission is doing, is, is so important and how we continue to learn along the way. And I know that the committee will receive information from the Fiscal Commission on how they are doing their forecast. And, and it's something we work very closely with the Fiscal Commission um, on as well, so that they understand our modelling, we understand their modelling, and of course their modelling goes into the budget. But that's um, our first protocol, is to ensure that we're getting the forecasting and modelling correct um, and to set out the budget as best as we can with the knowledge we can from the Scottish Fiscal Commission and then to move forward, as I've described, if there are any changes in year um, for a demand-led budget. And just a brief supplement, John, I mean, I, I, I presume, um, as Cabinet Secretary and Scottish Government, you're still committed to having all the benefits up and running by... 2021, which obviously will mean a greater, greater pressure um, around that. I mean, what, 
what you know, obviously, when you get to benefits such as PIP, DLA, which is much more demand-led and, and can be variation, uh, what work has been done maybe with DWP who have some experience of this just at a technical level so that by that stage we can be confident when we come to pass that budget that that amount of money will be there? I, I mean, you're absolutely right to point to, to, to PIP um, as, as an example. I would point to um, some of the, the cold weather payments as other payments that can vary really dramatically depending on um, the weather um, that, that we're having year on year. And I suppose this is one of the interesting areas that not just the Scottish Government, but the Scottish Parliament will have to look at as we continue our budgetary analysis to think differently about the budgets than we have done before, because it will have to be very much in the case in future years that we are taking um, great cognizance of the fact that we are talking about um, uh, substantial amounts of money that are demand-led and, in effect, not in the control of the Scottish Government. But I, I can re reassure Jeremy Balfour, we are doing a lot of work with the DWP. We may have our political differences, and they are great um, between um, the DWP and the, the Scottish Government. But at an official and an operational level, um, the, the relationships are exceptionally strong. Um, and there are no concerns I have around like that type of sharing of information so that we can do the best we possibly can. It is, of course, in the DWP's interest to make sure that we have a smooth transition as, as well as our own. And I'm very content that those relationships are working well. Uh, thank you. I think, I think that's encouraging. My, my second question is quite technical, so I, I'm happy if you can maybe take it. You may not know the answer. I mean, it was just going back to following a wee bit from um, Michelle Valentine's question around the cost of the uh, agency for this coming year. Um, facilities and property, according to our papers, break down at 4.2 million. Um, I mean, I'm no commercial lawyer, but my understanding, if I, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, that we have property at present in Dundee, um, which we have visited as a committee, and property in Glasgow. Um, of that 4.2, how much of it is on rent? Cause that does seem quite a high figure, and what kind of diligence was done to decide if that is the best value property-wise for a taxpayer to be spending on. And going forward, what other properties? Because I think, again, Scottish Government have committed to have local service, you know, people can go locally within the 32 local authorities. So what increase in that budget will be coming as that is rolled out um, in regard to more properties that the agency may have to either buy or, or rent? But don't have the breakdown for 4.2 within um, the, the figures that I have here, but we'll certainly um, can provide committee with further information on that. There's a great deal of due diligence done over our property strategy, and um, I'm sure the committee will be um, a, a aware of the um, analysis that was completed as we undertook where, for example, to have our headquarters um, in Scotland and, of course, Dundee was chosen around that. Um, the property that we have at the moment um, are uh, temporary properties. It's not our permanent um, properties within either Dundee or within Glasgow and we have committed to bring forward um, a property strategy um, later uh, this year on um, our longer term aspects around this. I suppose that this, the one point I, I will, um, would like to make around the, the local um, delivery is it's not necessarily local offices. What you're not going to have is somewhere um, in Edinburgh a Social Security Scotland office and in every single local authority there will be an office. It's how we can use our staff well uh, to, um, um, to, to take advantage of what's already out there. And the reason for that is we want to be where people are already rather than assuming that they're going to start coming to an independent office. And that is what people want us to see. So it will vary from um, local authority, local authority. But what it won't be is a building that we are either having to rent or buy in different areas. Now, now that could be uh, sharing with local authorities. It could be sharing with uh, someone in uh, the third sector, within health, for example. We're looking at all those different options. It will vary across the country, but it won't be a social security office. Thank you, Governor. Okay, thank you. Uh, final line of questioning, Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, the Fraser of Allender Institute and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation produced 
They published a blog last week raising doubts about how much the draft budget does to tackle child poverty. And the, in it, the blog says, it appears that this draft budget hasn't been geared towards tackling child poverty as a priority, despite the existence of statutory targets for 2030. Um, I'm sure you'll have your own views on that, Cabinet Secretary. And I'd just in particular like to understand what work um, your team has been involved in to establish what spending would be needed to start making progress towards achieving those targets? It's, it's certainly I have a, a number of joint meetings um, as committee would expect with Aileen Campbell who has the, the lead for the tackling child poverty uh, delivery plan to see how social security can assist with the delivery of that whether that's through <clears throat> best start grant payments um, Scottish welfare fund um, aspects um, around of course the income supplement which Ms Campbell and I have a, a joint resp responsibility for for um, taking forward um, I, I did note the the the, the blog uh, with with interest and I think it is quite right for us to be challenged to see whether we're doing enough on that I, I think when you look at what we are spending our money on within the social security budget it is in essence around um, ensuring that we have money to continue to develop what we need to do and implement the new benefits and also to deliver the benefits that we have on stream at the moment and those are specifically being designed to see what more we can do to tackle child poverty and to, to meet government targets. Um, I, I suppose I would um, point as well to the fact that is, um, it is not simply through social security that we will um, meet the tackling child poverty uh, targets um, and there are a myriad of, of different aspects and different portfolios. Um, it is important for example to ensure that we are delivering on our fair work programme um, and the, the living wage um, to r r um, raise people out of poverty in, in that manner so there's uh, less of a reliance on social security but also the myriad um, of work that's going on within um, different budgets, be it um, education, be it um, health, uh, to provide support for people on low incomes, as well as um, the more obvious budget headings, which perhaps sit in my portfolio or Ms Campbell's portfolio. Um, and um, that is something that I think is very important, is that we are looking at this um, at a cross-government level, not just within social security and communities, to ensure that we're delivering on those targets. Um, you mentioned income, the income supplement in your response and um, you'll be aware that in December a wide range of civic organisations wrote to the Cabinet Secretary for Finance um, expressing concerns that the proposed supplement wouldn't be available until 2022 perhaps. Now, I appreciate the government is not in favour of, of topping up child benefit, but do you think there's a place for that to be topped up in the interim? Um, and if not, you know, as well as answering that question, you know, income supplement is going to be means tested, which, you know, carries a whole, well, you know, there's a range of barriers there to be overcome. I'm, I'm just like to understand what action the government is taking to make sure that that supplement will reach those who need it too. Well, certainly the delivery plan um, in essence gives us two key tests for the income supplement um, the first one of those is to ensure it's targeted on families who need it most to lift the maximum number of children out of poverty and that is um, a very important target because one of my main concerns around the give me five um, campaign um, is that um, seven out of ten pounds will go to families who are not in poverty now at a point in time where um, we have such exceptionally tight budgets. I, I just don't feel that that is a useful way for us to spend our money and do believe that we need to um, ensure, as the plan says, that we are targeting our support to lift the maximum amount of children out of poverty. I couldn't in all conscience agree with the policy um, that, that, that doesn't um, do that. Um, and when it, the other challenge that is quite rightly given within the delivery plan is we look at a robust and viable delivery route, which kind of ties into this idea of, of an interim solution. The idea that a top-up to child benefit that would require um, intricate working um, with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs is something which could be done simply 
and quickly. It's just simply not the case. Um, and the analysis, um, all the work that we are doing with DWP around the work uh, for social security and the work that we're undertaking with um, HRMSC on other aspects which, which we have to link in with them, you simply, it, it doesn't make sense, I don't think, to have an interim solution that actually, in essence, would also take a long time to deliver. And one of the aspects that, I'll, I'll just finish on this point, um, and then happy to take any supplementary on it. One of the aspects that we're therefore looking at um, around delivery options is to look at uh, the time frames that these aspects would would take, the cost that the different delivery mechanisms would take as well, and um, that information will of course then be shared with Parliament and with the committee to genuinely look at how long in, in detail it, it takes to deliver the income supplement and the differences that the delivery option, whether it's a top up a child benefit um, or um, a, a new benefit in essence, what difference those would make. And it's very important, I think, as we move through the feasibility studies of the delivery options um, that I will um, report um, in the spring this year, that, that, we, take, um, that we take a lot of um, understanding from that. Because I am very concerned that um, a lot of the debate seems to suggest that this is easy to set up and the top up for child benefit could be done quickly. And I'm afraid that's just simply not the case. No, I, I suppose my concern, um, and I'm sure committee members share this, is, you know, we're just at the beginning of 2019. 2022, for people who are really struggling, is a long way away. So I would just ask that this is, you know, pursued with great urgency. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah, well, I could completely take that point, And hopefully the committee can take some assurance from the work that's ongoing around the feasibility study and um, option appraisals that will be undertaken um, at the start and early this year. Um, that um, will ensure that when the Cabinet Secretary for Communities and Local Government um, um, reports in June 2019, we are much further along in analysing all those different options and have done so in a way where we can have consultation, not just with Parliament, but with stakeholders around those delivery options. Thank you. Can I just check a technical question around some of that? When the income supplement does eventually uh, materialise, will that appear in your budget line, Cabinet Secretary, in relation to social security, because obviously child poverty is Aileen Campbell's um, remit as, as a cabinet secretary. I'm just wondering, this is a budget scrutiny session as well, really pertinent question to ask Alison Johnson, but just for future reference, whose budget line would that appear in? I think in essence it depends on the delivery mechanism. So I'm not going to give you an answer to that because we haven't decided on the delivery mechanism, but that would that would okay. in many I, ways dictate. But So my apologies, but it, it depends on the appraisal that, that we're doing. All right, that, that's helpful. Um, it's been a really worthwhile session. Can I thank both yourself, Cabinet Secretary, and both your officials uh, for this evidence session? I know the Cabinet Secretary is sticking around for the next, the next agenda item, but so we'll suspend briefly at this point till we change officials.
Everyone, we now move to agenda item three, European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. Uh, and I refer members to paper two, note by our committee clerk. On the 21st of December 2018, the committee received notification from the Scottish Government of its intent to consent to UK ministers making regulations on its behalf in relation to four statutory instruments. The Cabinet Secretary stayed on to provide further explanation and to answer any questions we may have. So thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, and so can I welcome both the Cabinet Secretary and Stephen O'Neill, Social Security Policy Team Leader. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Uh, and can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement and then we'll move to some questions. Thank you, Convener, and I will keep my remarks uh, relatively brief on this item. The statutory instruments described in the notification to Parliament makes a series of technical corrections to the EU Social Security Coordination Regulations retained by the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. <clears throat> These corrections will allow the UK Government to continue observing the existing coordination rules in the event of a no-deal Brexit. The effect is that EEA nationals living and working in Scotland will have the legal right to continue accessing Social Security on broadly the same basis as they do at present. It would also allow UK nationals living and working in the EEA to maintain their right to export certain benefits from the UK system to their country of residence and for contributions in other EEA countries to continue being counted towards a UK state pension and also towards eligibility for contributory benefits. However, as the notification makes clear, this would be a unilateral action of the UK government and in a no-deal scenario, there would be no legal obligation on EEA member states to reciprocate. It would, also, it would likely also to be a temporary solution until such a time as a longer-term arrangement could be found. As with all aspects of the UK's future relationship with the EU, it is distinctly unclear uh, what such arrangements would look like. But if the UK's white paper on immigration is anything to go by, it seems likely that in future the rights of EEA nationals to live and work in the UK and to access benefits will be significantly restricted. The Scottish Government has continually made clear to the UK Government that ongoing participation in social security coordination is essential for protection of citizens' rights. And it is the firm view of Scottish ministers that a no-deal Brexit would inflict especially severe social and economic harm on Scotland. It is therefore essential that contingency plans are in place to protect the people of Scotland, whatever their nationality, from the worst impacts of that outcome, an outcome which unfortunately is still too real a prospect. In that respect, the commitment of the UK Government to continue observing these rules in the immediate aftermath of a no-deal scenario is welcome even if it may do little to alleviate the longer-term concerns of people who have built their lives around the advantages afforded by freedom of movement. The devolved aspects to these SIs is relatively nuanced. They require devolved assistance to be provided in a manner consistent with the present coordination rules. In essence, that means treating EA nationals residing in Scotland in broadly the same we as UK nationals. <clears throat> the effect is therefore one of continuing a constraint on the exercise of devolved powers that presently exists through the, e the EU rules. The SIs mean Scottish ministers could still not, for example, propose eligibility rules that restrict access to social security for EE nationals. Since the Scottish Government would have no intention of doing so and it regards access to social security as a fundamental human right, we have absolutely no difficulty in consenting to that. That is especially given the severity of the alternative, which would be to dismantle the legal rights of EEA and UK nationals to social security protection across the EEA. So while this no-deal approach is far from a perfect solution, and that is an understatement, it is at least welcome that the UK's default position um, on social security is to continue to observe these rules come what may from the Brexit process. It is for that reason that I invite the committee to agree the view of ministers that consent should be granted to these statutory instruments. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, that was very helpful given a context to, to what we're discussing here this morning. Do any members have any questions in relation, relation to this? Uh, Keith Brown. Yes, a couple. Um, I understand the point the Cabinet Secretary has made in relation to um, this will restrict our freedom of choice, but perhaps not in a way that we would choose to exercise that freedom. Um, nevertheless, it still restricts our freedom of choice, and it seems to me appalling that with 70 days to go, we are being faced with this. I, I have no substantive objection, but I just wonder, can you confirm that the Scottish Government has seen the statutory instruments and, and whether this committee has seen the actual statutory... Just that the briefing that we've got talks about um, they'll be submitted to the Westminster Parliament sitting committees on the 13th of December. 
and it talks about in the future tense. I'm just wondering wh where we're at with these, or have we, have, and I'm well aware in relation to my recent time in the Health Committee that um, not only was the Scottish Government's designation of it as a Category A challenged by uh, SPICE, I think correctly, um, I'm not sure that's true in this case, but the notice that we got wasn't sufficient and also um, that committee had to agree to SIs it had not even seen and that the Scottish Government hadn't even seen. They'd been given an understanding of what would be in them. So just useful to get some background as to what status they have just now. Uh, certainly the, the Scottish Government has seen them and they are publicly um, available and we can um, uh, ensure that that link has, has been um, afforded directly to the, the committee if it's not already uh, done so. It is a, a UK government aspect. Um, in essence, these are exceptionally technical. They, they, they um, lead to over, a, over 100 pages, really, of, of technical amendments. For example, taking out any reference to member state because that simply is not the case. So they are exceptionally technical amendments with those types of changes, um, but over over 100 pages of, of those. So it really is um, 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 exceptionally technical in nature and it's changes around terminology that just don't fit under um, a circumstance where the UK is outside the EU. And just to say, presumably, and it'd be useful to hear perhaps from Mr O'Neill as well on this, the UK government could have done this months ago. Um, the idea that we, we just to let uh, you know that we've not been able to, or, or the time that we've had in recess over Christmas is counted towards a 28-day period, which I think is wrong, albeit that's been agreed between this Parliament, Westminster and the government as well. But this could have been done months and months ago, as far as I can tell. There is no reason. People are saying, well, there's not much time left to do it, but there's a reason for that, because the UK government hasn't moved on it, or, or am I wrong? Is there something that's prevented them from doing this before now? I think it's hard to dispute um, what Mr Brown says about, about that. Um, the, there's, there's nothing, um, as I understand it, that would stop the UK government taking action um, sooner than it has on this. Okay. Yeah, are there any other, other questions? Okay. Um, it may just be worth put, putting on the record, um, because our Clark and team are very good at identifying whether uh, we're aware of any challenges that have been made to the proposed instruments and whether any issues have been drawn to, to our attention. Um, and I can confirm that that, that hasn't been, been the case, although I absolutely take on board the, the, the point that Mr Brown made about the, the, the 28 days and uh, the link to the statute instruments is, is, is available. So it's just to put that on the record. If, if there are no other questions, just before we, we, we move on at this point, uh, can I therefore... Um, Thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary and uh, Mr Neil for coming along and uh, we will now move to Agenda Item 4. And Agenda Item 4 is subordinate legislation and refer members to Paper 3, note by the Clerk. Uh, the Committee is invited to consider the Scotland Act 1998 Agency Arrangement Specification No. 2, Order 2018, SSI 2018-1344, which is subject to the negative procedure. Is the committee content to note the instrument? Okay. Enthusiastically, I would also <laughs> note, but we are noting, we are noting the instrument. And as agreed at agenda item one, we now move to agenda item five, which were previously agreed to take in private. So we now move into private session.